I love to see the towns passing by and arrive these rails neath God's blue sky. Let me travel this land from the mountains to the sea, cause that's the life I believe. And when I'm gone and at my grave you stand, say God called home your rambling man. Welcome to Ramblin' Man Podcast, episode number 63. This one is with Adam Newman, and we talk about art and mental health. We kind of go back and forth, kind of his journey into art. If you'd like more information about Adam, you can find him online at Newman Adam Art, N-E-W-M-A-N-A-D-A-M-A-R-T.com. Our sponsor this week is Feral Giant. Feral Giant is a graphic design, illustration, and social media company out of Knoxville, Tennessee. They do work for clients large and small. If it's digital or creative, they've got you covered. You can find more information about them at feralgiant.com or on any of the social at Feral Giant. They have recently started a video series called Uncertain Creativity that they've been posting to YouTube. You can find a link in their Instagram in the bio. It's discussions with creatives and business owners on what they're doing in these uncertain times. Again, that's Instagram.com slash Feral Giant and go through the bio link. Without much further ado, here's the episode. I don't think I've had a Thunderstruck coffee porter four years i i gotta uh, be honest i do not know how old that beer is <laughs> like I, it I, might be that old yeah i have uh, i i started a rule highland and, just kind of like they're not I, they're not they're not like thunderstruck's the only one i like yeah they're just uh i think they're just like uh i don't know they're a little disappointing i think when they when craft beer first became a little more mainstream yeah. because they were local uh-huh. I saw them a lot more, but now that it's even more mainstream, I n- rarely ever see. Mm-hmm. I see Sierra Nevada and Terrapin more than yeah. I see Thunderstruck. Are we or, recording now? Yep. Yep. Okay, we're cool. recording now. Uh, now, I remember like uh, whenever I first moved to Knoxville, um, coming from uh, Roan County, which is like, yeah, you know, it's just 45 minutes down the road, but it's yeah. like, it's a different world, you know? <laughs> like, uh, yeah. And, um, the first like couple of months I was here, I was like going out, uh, to bars, like after work and stuff, you know, working in the service industry. And it was like, uh, yeah, it was like Highland and Sawworks <laughs> before. Oh, wow. Wow. <laughs> yeah. The Sawworks Brown. Yeah. That was like my go-to beer. I was just like Sawworks Brown everywhere I go. So do you remember, <clears throat> did you ever, so because I know it was hugely a, industry bar corner bp did you go to oh corner yeah B? yeah no i, I was there place. on their last night i miss that place so much like yeah it was a shit show and if you i remember one night we were there and we had a drunk friend with us so we ordered her food it took three hours for that food to come out <laughs> and i just laughed at if the food came out i was like oh shit i forgot we ordered i just figured y'all didn't order food for her and they're like <laughs> no we ordered it three hours ago when we got here and i was like Holy f- we could have literally walked somewhere yeah. and got to go, <laughs> ate it, and then went back and got second. Like it was No, yeah, I remember that place. I liked I I I liked that it was it was really divey. It was and open. uh I don't I don't yeah, like I don't I don't know if this is okay to say, but like the the last night that they were open, like they had a fire out in the front and uh they let us like drink till like five. In the morning, they <laughs> it was they were very. That's why I said it was a service industry bar because they mm-hmm. were very. I think because they were serving <clears throat> out of cans. Like when yeah. they first started out, they didn't even have taps. They, you just bought a can of beer. I think they yeah they had one of those like big 
yeah. uh, refrigerators just, that were like yeah. on the floor. Yeah. Like that you open like a coffin. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I don't know what you call those refrigerators. I don't. But. I don't know. But yeah. It, and they would just they, grab cans but, of beer out of there. Because they were open, like friends and I used to go there and sit and smoke cigars. Because it was wide open. It was yeah. like, yo, we don't give a shit. Do whatever you want. And it's like. And we would usually be the only people there. <laughs> so we would just <laughs> lay back in the sun and smoke cigars and drink beer. And it's like, this is kind of amazing. Friends would bring oh, they, their dogs. They had that, they had that game. Oh, You'd yeah. Throw the ring, like, like yeah. that's that jig and reel. That's also the first place I ever saw the giant Jenga. That, oh, really? That we would play that on top of one of the tables. And then shortly thereafter, I used to go to Beer and Beer Market a lot yeah. more. Yeah, because they've back had then. it for a But long I think time. it's the last few times it's when they i just end up there during their running nights and it's always over jam packed with people and i'm like ah. oh at, at beer market yeah i was like i kind of <clears throat> like this when it's a little bit more lax and yeah. i think it's now i see a lot more dogs like almost getting in fights and shit there to where i was like i'm, I'm good i'm good <laughs> i'm gonna just go to crafty where there's only three dogs and they're all chill and get along with one another Let's go to the fights tonight. Yeah. The dog fights. Yeah, dog fights. <laughs> <laughs> this podcast was shortly thereafter canceled. Uh, sponsored by... Sponsored, sponsored beer, by beer Michael market, Vick's... Dog fights. <laughs> Michael Vick's <laughs> Vick's ra- Vapor Rub. <laughs> Why they did not hit him up for sponsorship, I have no idea. <laughs> Afterwards, after the dog fights, I understand, but before. Uh, okay, so you came from Roan County. Yeah. What brought you... Did you go to school at UT? What brought you to... No, man. It was uh, just the, the <clears throat> big city. So the reason I came to Roan County was... Or the reason I came to Knoxville from Roan County was... Uh, uh, man, so... Mm, like, Roan County is a very small town. It's, it's very country. Uh, people have, like, a very set idea of, like, how life is supposed to be there. Right. And I was following along with that. You know, uh... You, you you go to school, you meet someone, you get married, you start having kids, you get the house, um, pick a fence, like all that stuff, right. you know, like the American dream type thing. And and I had that. Like I, yeah. I was I was married. Okay. Um, we had we had a house and I was very thankful for it. It was uh, she her mother had passed away whenever uh, she was younger. And had left the house to her, and uh, we moved into that. Uh, but you know, things just didn't work out, right? <clears throat> and so, um, and uh, I mean, like, romantic relationships are not very easy for me. Uh, I mean, <laughs> as a 41 year old single dude, <laughs> no, they're not easy in general. Uh, I'm, yeah, well, I imagine there's a if. There's there's somebody out there listening that that connects with that, yeah. but uh, yeah, there it's it's not easy for me. Um, but anyway, like uh, yeah, it it didn't work out, and um, I had like this whole friend group, like a, a core group of people that I yeah. would hang out with, and we had all met in college, and we were all like on the same path, like we were all gotten married at the same time, and yeah. and some of them were starting to have kids, and like. And then here, like I have this roadblock, like I'm, I'm getting divorced and, um, you know, like, uh, you know, we were still friends and everything like, uh, you know, they'd have like nights of like hanging out at each other's houses and stuff. And I would go and then it was, it was always just like, you know, each couple was there and then it was like, here's Newman and he's divorced, you know? And it just like. It just it, it just really got to me and like I I just like I didn't want to be there. Right. Like I, I I just I felt like so excluded. Right. I mean, it wasn't them. Like I mean they yeah. were they were they were there for me and everything, but like I just I just felt on the outside. Right. And like I, I just wanted to get out of there. And yeah. so and but then I it, moved to, to Knoxville. To use Yiddish, my <clears throat> former boss says Michigas. Michigosh. Michigas. Third time star, Michigan. I keep adding an H, H on that, Michigan. Mm-hmm. Uh, your own like internal craziness, where I would be like, no, I don't <laughs> want to do that because you know I didn't like that this person did this. She's like, that's your own Michigan. And I was like, oh okay, like it's not their problem, it's your problem. 
Mm-hmm. It's like your own like internal roadblock of just like, yeah, I don't want to get, yeah, this is not making me feel good right now. Yeah. I think everybody's got a little bit of that in their own, like I said, off of mic. Like I've got a weird thing now of like, I, I heard this from a UFC fighter, which it was, if I text somebody a couple of times and they don't get back to me and they're a friend of mine, I text him back and say, I'm starting to get feelings, man. <laughs> Cause it's just like, <laughs> you need to respond. You need to respond. If we're going to be yeah. friends, you gotta, there's gotta be a, a, a volley back and forth. Yeah. It's like definitely. everybody gets busy, everybody, but you got to respond, man. And there's been a couple of guys been like, okay, okay. I don't want to make you angry. I was like, okay, that's good. But I'm starting to get feelings, yeah. brother. Like, and that's my own little, whatever you call it, hiccup. Yeah. Now, if I'm being honest, like, I, I, I really feel like I was just like, uh, I just like, like I said, romantic relationships are, are really hard for me. Yeah. And like the fact that like I had found this person and I thought that like this was it. Yep. And like I had settled in my mind, like this is it. This is, yeah. and I was at peace with that. And I was like, I, I love this person. Yeah. And then it didn't work out, you know, like I, I just like, I had to get away from there. Right. And, uh, yeah, like, so I came here and, started working at stock and barrel like yeah. stock and barrel had just opened on market square and like I, I i started working there like two weeks after they opened and i remember i remember you like yeah. you, you were like oh, one you of the first when they first opened no i i it was okay. two weeks after they opened For whenever some reason, i got I thought hired we went there the first night they were <clears> open and that's where i met you because i sat in the same exact spot two nights in a row that's you did, thing, that's but, it, I but it, yeah, and I, I remember that because like, that's, that's how I remember you is the, that I waited on you a couple <laughs> of times in the same, it was, a, it was that last table yep. up, up against the wall. It, it was literally back to back nights, one with my friend Aaron, <laughs> where we went and saw the BAMP film series at Bijou and she, this was still the funniest thing ever. We're sitting there and it's very compact. Everybody's on top of one another. Mm-hmm. Aaron and I are sitting there and she's looking at the menu and she's who the fuck would come in here and order a burger salad right as you brought and sat down the woman who was sitting next to her burger salad. I was like, you're an idiot. You're an idiot. <laughs> and then the next night, my friends who lived in a house over here, they bought an Airstream, spent a year fixing it up and then quit their jobs and set out on the road. There were two young women that were renting their house and I didn't really know them. I'd only met them at their going away party. Mm -hmm. So I was texting with them. I was like, me have a beer. Just I'm in the neighborhood. You're literally a hundred yards from me. It's like, if you ever need anything, I'm here. So we went and had a beer and that's, it was two nights in a row and you walked around. I was like, Oh shit. Hey man, (laughs) (laughs) two nights in a row, man. I was like, for some reason I had my mind. It was like, Day one they opened it. Yeah. Day two, but I guess it was two. Weeks I mean, ago. you were easy to remember. Yeah. I mean, no offense. You're you're very uh, you, you stand so. out. You would think so. <laughs> People forget me a lot. Really? Yeah. Oh, you want here's here's some realness. I just matched with a gal on a dating app who I met. She said twice before. I don't remember the first time. She had to remind me the second time, and it was something like in passing three months ago. Uh huh. She actually told me. She was like, I can't date somebody who doesn't remember meeting me. And then next message said twice. And I was like, well, one time was in passing at a summit where there were 400 people there. That doesn't count. Like I, I, if we shook hands or something, mm-hmm. I don't even remember. <clears throat> uh, you didn't sit down and have a conversation with me. And then the second one, I was like, eh, okay, I just forgot you. And I was like, but also I'm six, seven. <laughs> It's easier to remember me yeah, than just yeah. some random, I don't know. But she uh, ended up disconnecting with me because of that. Because she couldn't foresee dating somebody who did not remember meeting her twice. So, okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. You See ya. Way now. <laughs> uh, okay, so you start working at Stock and Barrel. And yeah, and, uh, you know, um, so were like... Were you doing the chalk art then? Or did you um, like whenever later? they first opened? Yeah, like I, I would do, I would do like some like funny chalk art stuff for them and everything. Like and and I would get paid in like a like a burger or oh. something. Oh, 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 <laughs> like, <laughs> but and I mean, actually, you know what I was doing at that time, I would feel like it, it was worth that. Like oh, okay. I, I'm not, I'm not. Uh, let me first say that like the stock and barrel guys. Um, 
you know, like I'm, I'm most passionate about the work that I yeah. make in my studio. Yeah. Uh, because like whenever I'm in my studio, it's, it's my world. Right. And, right. uh, if you want to get into that later, I would yeah. be glad yeah. to, but like, uh, just, uh, as far as the stock and barrel guys go, uh, they're also like the Chivo guys. Um, like I, I do, I do commissions and like I do commercial work and stuff like that right. for people around town. And, you know, like sometimes, I mean, I mean, anybody in a creative field is going to, going to feel this way. Sometimes it can be like a chore, yeah. you know, because like you're, you're really trying to meet like with someone on their vision and your vision. And like, it's, it's just kind of like, it, it's hard to make that connection sometimes, yeah. but like the stock and barrel guys, like they just, uh, they've just like, they've just always trusted me, Yeah, you know? And like, they, they give me like something, they might say like two words about something, like just like give it to me and I can go and create whatever. And like, yeah. I don't have to be worried about what I present to them. Like I just, okay we just have like that thing where like, I know that I'm going to show them something and they're going to be down with it. Okay. You know, like, so like, uh, the mural that I did in Nashville. Yeah. Like it was kind of weird. Cause like, I didn't even think about it until like after the fact it was like weeks or like maybe a month after I'd finished that mural. Mm -hmm. Uh, like there were some things that I did to that mural that were not in the conceptual sketch yeah. or anything that I showed them before. And then I, it like hit me. I was like, man, maybe I should have said something to them about this. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but like, I, I, I didn't. And it was just because like, I'm, I'm so comfortable like working with them, like, and, yeah. and that they trust me enough to like, know that like, I know what I'm doing and like, I, right. I'm going to give them something great every time I work for them. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So that's anyway, good. It, it, you yeah. know, there are people that, uh, I always refer to it as there's there's a, a big chunk of the work is not up on the website because mm -hmm. you don't want to get that work even more. But that work is also some of the stuff that pays the bills. Yeah, to let you do the stuff that you want to do. And in the the oh man, like I I just like I I cannot be like more yeah. grateful for that that mural in 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 the gulch. Yeah, because like um. You know, like most commercial work, like it involves some kind of like advertisement or whatever right. for right. for the business, and they basically just like gave me that wall and like allowed me to put a vision that I had right. in my head on it, and so like it's it's like it's just this huge piece of artwork that I get to to share with yeah. like thousands of people, and like I that's pretty much like all I ever get tagged on in. Uh, uh, on Instagram anymore is like people taking pictures with, <laughs> my, with my mural and that was the point and um, it's if if you're not familiar with the mural it's a big ear that has a microphone um, to the side and like uh, colored smoke coming out of the microphone to the ear and the whole point behind it was that like uh, you know I wanted to do something that Related to the city, obviously, as Music right. City. So, you know, I wanted to speak to the city. Um, <clears throat> but, like, you know, I'm an artist, and I... Talking about Music City, you know, like, if you're a musician, you stand in front of a microphone in the in the, in the front of a, of a room, like, on a stage. Yeah. And that commands attention. Right. Like, everybody for the most part is probably going to stop what they're doing and like, listen to what you're right. You're singing, you're saying, okay. So for a visual artist, it's a little bit different. Cause like you put your image out there and people can walk right on by if they want to. Yeah. Yeah. You know, but like, so I, I made an image that I hoped people would stop in front of and it would take them to a place where they only heard what they saw. Okay. Okay. And, uh, it kind of played into like this idea of like my father, um, he was an artist as well. Okay. Um, but I feel like he, um, I feel like he died with his song still in him. Okay. If that makes okay. sense. Yeah. Like I feel, I feel like he didn't, he didn't really fulfill, uh, what he had in right. him as far as like an artist goes. Right. And, um, it was so kind of it was like a little bit of a tribute to him like 
uh, I'm not going to do the same thing. Like right. I'm going to sing my song. I'm going to leave footprints. People are going to know that I was here. Right. What What kind of artist was he? Uh, he <laughs> he. Uh, this is funny. Like I don't I don't do anything like this. Okay. Like uh, I mean, whenever I was a little kid, like I. I looked up to my father and like, I was, I thought it was really cool that he could like paint. Yeah. And that's probably the reason why I started getting into it and like drawing and stuff. Cause I, I would try to like mimic drawings and stuff that he had done. Okay. But like he did like Bob Ross type shit. Okay. My friend refers to those as couch paintings. Because yeah. they usually hang up on couches. <laughs> Wait, what do you got? No, no they don't. No. no, I do not have. <laughs> you don't have. I have any. Johnny Cash and a Shining documentary. And I mean, it. that's fine if that's what you want. You know, yeah. like uh, it's, um, yeah, no, that's what he did. He did oil paintings of like okay. uh, landscapes and stuff, and he was really good at it. Yeah. I mean, they're great paintings. Yeah. And uh, I mean, they captivated me as a little kid. You know, like, uh, and I, I, I really looked up to him. The first painting that I ever made was with acrylic on a canvas uh, in his apartment in downtown Harriman. Yeah, there is a downtown wow. for Harriman. Yes. And people uh, live in downtown <laughs> Harriman. That's even. I, Unfortunately, yeah. they do. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, right. But no, yeah, there was a, that that was the first painting that I ever made. And it's, it's, it's hanging in my, my mother's house right now. It's, yeah. it's terrible. Uh, but, uh, anyway, yeah, I just, I really looked up to him. That's, that's the kind of artwork that he did. Did he, he did it as a hobby or he did it as a a gig? He did it. He did as a hobby. Like, uh, you know, I, 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 like this is, this is probably me just projecting like myself onto him, but like, I feel like he probably could have done more with it. Uh, he worked mostly as like, a in managerial positions in like, uh, uh, several restaurants, okay. gas stations, truck stops. Okay. Uh, and then he, he, in the later years of his life, he drove a truck until, um, he, uh, I guess he didn't, he didn't work. He was, uh, he, the last two years of his life, I, I didn't speak to him. Oh, okay. okay. And I had no idea what was going on with him. And he had, uh, um, he passed away at the oh, Salvation man. Army shelter here on Broadway in Knoxville. Oh God! Okay. Yeah. Oof. Uh. How? How many of his paintings still remain? Like, is there? I don't. I don't have any of them. You don't have any of them. Your mom doesn't have any of them. Uh, I think my mom has like a a folder of like some drawings. Yeah. And maybe like some watercolor paintings yeah. that he did. Um, did but he as have far any, as like canvases and stuff, he like, didn't no. have any family that he would pass them along to. <clears throat> uh, well, <laughs> and this is trending into dark territory. We can uh, go a different no. way, or this is fine. Uh, this is fine, man. Okay. Uh, he, um, like, uh, my grandmother, uh, she passed away when I was like in eighth grade. Okay, and um, whenever she passed away, my the man that I knew as my grandfather, who was actually a step grandfather, because okay. I had never met my real grandfather until uh-huh. probably like six years ago. Oh wow! Uh, okay. But like uh, he, he just kind of like took everything and jeez and left. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. and I, I've seen that on two sides of my family, like people uh, dying and then just like just pillaging everything. So like, yeah. Uh, trust is a big thing for me. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, I've, I've experienced that with some of my friends where it's somebody dies and a sibling will be like, okay, now how do we get all of this money? Like yeah. that's their first, like not even worrying about burying their parents mm-hmm. to where the first thing they, that runs their mind is, oh, we've got a lot of money coming to us. How are we going to make that happen? Yeah. Which is, I don't know. My, when my grandmother passed away, actually she was in a home for, I think the last three years of her life because she had dementia and Alzheimer's extremely bad to yeah. where we finally had to put her in a home because she would just get in her car and leave to where we had to take away her car privileges, take away her keys because she would just go driving for like six hours trying to find home. And, uh, <laughs> this is a 
it's funny in my mind. My dad and uncle sat on and left her house unoccupied for like three or four years because they were like, there is so much shit up here to go through. <laughs> they were like, they were in no rush. They were like, good God, there's so much. And to, to where dad was just like, we have to get this done. He's yeah. like, this is kind of nuts. Like, But my grandfather collected everything. So the basement and garage were just stacked. Oh, dude, my, my, uh, my grandparents' house on my mother's side. Yeah. Uh, other side of the family, uh, it still is <laughs> setting in Embry Heights and Harriman, um, vacant. And it yeah. has been since 2009 when my grandfather wow. died because my mom, aunt and uncle are all feuding. Oh God. Because the yeah. same thing happened on that side of the family. Yeah. Yeah. Family is, <laughs> family is, uh. It really hurts me too because like that yeah. that place was like really special to me. Yeah. My my grandmother's house on my 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 mother's side. Yeah. And I recently figured out why. Like I mean obviously I knew that it was like really important to me. She yeah. she my grandmother on my mother's side was probably the outside of my dad was probably the family member that I was most close to. Okay. Um Okay. <clears throat> Uh, she, I used to love being there, uh, because I would go out in the woods cause she had like a lot of acreage and yeah. I would go out in the woods and I was from the age of like 10 to embarrassingly 14. Yeah. I love to pretend that I was a soldier. <laughs> like no that's fine yeah i mean like 14 <laughs> though i was <laughs> 14. i should have been moving on to oh. other things but like i love to go out and pretend that i was a soldier and uh i mean like i would draw battle plans at night whenever i could not be outside and like i i had like i had everything mapped out like i spent my whole day i made flags um I this had, is how you got your creativity out that's the that's way to that's exactly it. what I'm getting to. Like yeah. I even had like this little tin uh, cup. It was a measuring cup that my grandmother got from her grandmother, and Holy it was crap. it was just made out of tin, and it was it looked like a coffee cup, but it was it was actually a measuring cup, and it had like the measurements marked out on it. Yeah, and I I would put that on uh, like my belt loop so that it would clang against other things whenever I was like quote marching yeah <laughs> around yeah. and uh but the thing about that was is that and I, I didn't like I said before like I didn't figure this out until recently like um um let me try to tie three things together okay what I just said I've also like always had this great appreciation for plays like, okay I love plays okay and it's because you go into the space and you know that it's not real. It's obviously make believe. Yeah. You can see the curtains, you can see the lights, you can see all the stage production. You know that it's a set that's been designed. You know that these actors are out right. and they're going behind scenes and changing clothes and like you know it's make believe. Right. But whenever you see a good production, it still manages to like take you to somewhere. Yeah. And that's just magic to me. Yeah. Like I love that. Yep. So much. And so that plus like me being in my studio. Yeah. Whenever I'm working on a show, like a solo show and I have an idea and it's something that I'm trying to express and everything that I do is always like something that comes from within me. Like that's the only thing that I know how to make work about. Like I can't, like my father, he, you know, he did the landscapes and stuff. Like I don't do that because like, I just, I can't make a good expression about that. Like I want to make an expression about something that I've been through, something that's touched me or something that I've touched. And so whenever I'm in my studio and I'm putting together these panels. I do all my work on wood panels and right. I use mixed media. I use anything that will get me to the product of whatever I want someone to see, uh, to best communicate whatever I'm feeling or whatever I'm trying to, uh, put out there. But like whenever I'm in there, 
I get that same feeling. Okay. That same feeling is that whenever I was out in the woods pretending to be a soldier. Yeah. The same feeling is whenever I'm in a playhouse watching a good play, a okay. good production. Okay. I feel that whenever I'm in my studio, and it's like a little bit of magic. Okay. So is the studio kind of like a, I won't say like a retreat, to where it's almost like the rest of the world is blocked out when you're in your studio? Yes and no? Yeah, yeah, no. <laughs> yeah, no. Uh, the no part would be like, uh, <clears throat> uh, for instance, like uh, last summer I displayed some work at the Emporium and I called the show Delusionary. Okay. And it was all about like these unhealthy thoughts and stuff that I have in romantic relationships. Like I was saying before, right. like I'm just not good at real romantic relationships. Okay. And so like whenever I get in one, like I just, my mind just kind of runs rampant. And okay. um, so like I wanted to express that somehow. And in everything that I do, I feel like I'm investigating myself. Okay. Self-reflection. Okay. Yeah, like like all my work's introspective and like I I kind of I guess I kind of do it in hopes that I'm going to like get to the bottom of it and like fix it. Okay. You know. Okay. So your didn't art didn't happen. <laughs> with... <laughs> yeah, I'm trying I'm trying to think your art is your journey. Your didn't art. happen with the, the delusionary thing. Oh like I, I'm still not good at romantic relationships, oh but uh but uh anyway, yeah, so uh, I did that show, and um, shit. I'm sorry. Why, why were we talking about that? <laughs> you were tying three. I, I had asked you if, when you were in your studio, if you felt like that was your escape from. Oh the yeah. Studio. Okay. So yeah. No. So whenever I was doing that show, like a big part of that one was, uh, I think that's where like I really gained my. Best appreciation for music. Okay. Because, you okay. know, like, here's what I love about music. Um, I don't, I mean, I can kind of play a guitar, but it's nothing notable. Right. Like, uh, the best thing about music is, to me at least, is like you listen to a song and it takes you somewhere. And okay. it's usually somewhere you've already been, right? Okay. Okay. So, like, I can listen to a song on repeat for hours yeah. or even days. If it takes me somewhere and I want to stay in that place, I will listen to it until I'm ready to leave. Okay. Okay. And so, and and a lot of the pieces that I've ever made, like I will listen to one song the entire time that I'm making it. Okay. Because it takes me to that place. Okay. So like whenever I was making the Delusionary series, um, there was a lot of music that I was listening to that, you know, like whenever you go through like a breakup and and – there's like certain songs that you don't want to hear. Yeah. <laughs> oh. Okay. So yeah. basically I forced myself to listen Ooh. to those songs because I wanted, I I mean, it, I felt like it was my responsibility. Like I'm making yeah. this work and I'm making this work about like these unhealthy thoughts and like how, what basically what it's like to be on the outside looking in of your own romantic relationship. Right. And I wanted to make the work, uh, as true as possible. So like I listened to those songs Man. and, and yeah, it, it did not feel good, but I feel like it, yeah. it helps bring out the truest expression and that's what I'm always chasing. So it's when you're in the studio, the outside world does not come in except for from within. Mm -hmm. that, that's a poet's version of it. Like you're listening to that music and it's reminding you and taking you to a place but anything outside of that is not coming in. Does that make sense? Yeah. It's where it's almost like you're you're locked in on your own mind. Yeah, dude. I mean, I feel like uh I feel like I just spend yeah, <laughs> pretty much my entire life in my own mind. I And that and that's to a fault, I um, I believe it. Uh, but uh, but also like a cost um of you know, like making, I don't know, man. I, I just feel like uh, being an artist is like, 
if you're if you're making stuff that my entire goal is like I just I want people to look at the artwork that I right. make and I want there to be like some kind of connection. Okay. I don't I don't want anybody to look at my artwork and just be like, man, that's beautiful. Right. Or or that looks great. Like I don't want to hear that. Like I want to I want someone to tell me that like they see my artwork and it takes them to this place or okay. it makes them think of this. Okay. And if there's any kind of connection there, that's my greatest reward for making something. Okay. Okay. Uh So, and I'm going to go back to what you're talking about with the mural. So when you start a new piece, do you have a fully fleshed out idea in your mind or are there times where you just start uh -huh. and you're like, I'm just going to go wherever this takes me. Yeah. Well, see, that depends. Okay. Um, this is funny. Uh, so I was thinking like the last couple of weeks about, so I had four shows last year. Okay. First was at Honeybee. Okay. I remember that. Uh, second was at, Mark Carson English's gallery, uh, whenever it used to be right next to Robin Easter design. Uh, oh yeah. I went yeah. to that one too. You went to that one too. I'm yeah. I remember two, you I'm going to this. <laughs> <laughs> and then the third was delusionary at the Emporium. I didn't see you there. Where were you? I'm just kidding. Uh, and then I'm trying to remember what, what month was that? August. I was in Florida. Okay. I was visiting friends because I, I was like, <laughs> I usually stop in the Emporium because that's the biggie to yeah. stop in. It's like, no, August I was in because somebody else, I had I missed like three shows uh -huh. because I was in Florida. Let's see, Friday night, I think that night. No, that was Thursday night that we went to a football game in Jacksonville. So I was sitting in a bar smoking or sitting outside a bar smoking cigars, drinking beer on Friday night. Well, so I was enjoying your myself. excuse, man. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was in St. Augustine, Florida, where it's never really that hot. Even in August, mm -hmm. it was like 60 degrees at night. And I was like, oh, God, this is amazing. <laughs> this yeah. feels so good. Like, this is, yeah. So, yeah. Okay, so that's the third one. So I'm two for yeah. three. So the fourth was at Honeybee again. Okay. Which was really unexpected to me. Uh, I was honestly just like sitting in there drinking a cup of coffee one day yeah. and one of the managers went by and I was like, Hey, uh, do you mind if I just like hang a couple pieces? Yeah. Um, cause like I had all this work in my studio and like, I, I wasn't sure where I was showing next, yeah. blah, blah, blah. And she was like, uh, she was like, well, you can do a whole show again if you yeah. want, like you did before. And I was like. Yeah, like I'm I'm never going to turn that down. I think um, that one I missed because they started closing earlier than they used to. And so by the time I made it out there, they were already gone. Yeah. Like I literally think I pulled in the parking lot. I was like, what the fuck? Oh, Come on, man, son that of sucks. Bitch. We were there till like nine. Okay. Uh, But that one, that one's really special to me because like I think that one, like I really, um, that one helped me really learn what I want to do okay. with my artwork. Wait, what month but, was it? Now, uh, now I'm me, thinking about it. I'm like, let me get back to that. Yeah. Cause like the whole point of me, uh, mapping out all these four shows was yeah. to say like, um, you can look, I, I can look at those four shows and the content of them yeah. and see where I was at. Yeah. This whole past year. Okay. Like they were all four disparate. They were all shows. four different. Okay. And they were all four like, very telling of where I was at personally. Okay. Like the first one at Honeybee was these uh, bright colored prints and they were very simple. Oh, yeah. You bought one of the yep, prints, I've didn't got you? One yeah, you got one it. here. So, <laughs> yeah, they were two uh, giant boxes of prints and artwork <laughs> in there that I finally had to buy boxes for because I was yeah. like, I can't frame all of this. This would cost, I don't have enough walls in this house to hang up everything I've bought. But yeah, so like I was, yeah. I was like, I was very happy then. Yeah. And then uh, the the second show at Mark Carson English's gallery in March, that one was uh, it was very uh, hyper realistic, and okay. so like I had uh, uh, if if anybody follows me, they probably know that I have like a, uh, a pastel drawing of a of an apron, a server mm -hmm. apron that I put up uh, and pinned up in my studio and I, I just like replicated it onto this wood panel. Yeah. And I like the fact that it was 
pinned up because like it was it was almost like in a uh, crucifix like okay posture yeah uh, but like it was just displaying like a basically like the the humility and everything that I learned from being in the service industry. Okay. And okay. uh coming into the service industry from my time in Rome County was like me giving up on romanticism. Okay. From like my life of being like married and like coming to like a place where I was like all right, this is it. I'm just going to like drink beer and get drunk every night and uh yeah, yeah I'm just going to fucking serve tables. <laughs> what, were you, what were you doing in Rome County before you moved to Knoxville? Uh, a lot of things. I was I worked at a screen printing shop. Okay, um, designing T-shirts for like fucking local high schools and yeah. shit like that. Uh, yeah, a lot of boring stuff. Okay, but uh, anyway, and so then yeah, so it, everything was very clear because yeah. like my mind was so clear then. Yeah, and then the delusionary thing, uh, it was more expressionistic. Because I was I was on a subject that I did not understand. Okay. Like the subject of love and romantic relationships. Yeah. And my crazy thoughts that I feel like I have whenever I'm in one of them. Um, yeah. So like it didn't make sense to me. So there was no way for me to make that real. Yeah. So like it was very expressionistic. And then in December, uh, the show Exposed, which was about mental health, which is something okay. that like I've... I've dealt with for a long time and it kind of like resurfaced to me in October. Uh, and so it was very quite an ample opportunity for me to have that show in, in December because, you know, like I I was like, well, this is where I'm at. So this is what I'm going to make work about. Yeah. And, and it turned out that it was like, it was like this mix of like realism and expressionism. Okay. Like it was it was it was in between somewhere. Okay. Which makes sense because it was like stuff that I know really well because I've experienced it a lot in my life, but also I just I don't know where it's going. Okay. But what I loved about the uh exposed show was that um Honeybee like they were just so amazing about it. Like uh I think I learned there that like I'm I mean, I, I'm grateful for every opportunity that I get, but like they were so awesome because like they let me transform that space into what I wanted it to be. And if I had more time, I would have pushed it way further. Okay. But like they let me turn the lights out uh in that main room. Yeah. And we're talking about Honeybee South yeah. on Severe Avenue. Um they let me turn that light turn the lights out on the main room and it all played into the theme of the show, which was, you know, mental health and things that we don't like to talk about, things that we, you know, shy away from. And I've had these experiences where, like, I've tried to, like, reach out to a friend and be like, hey, this is what's going on with me. And, like, they don't know what to say. Yeah. You know, because yeah. it's like it's 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 uncomfortable for people. Yeah. So I put the work in the dark and let people go through with flashlights or their phones and look at the work. Maybe that's why I didn't see. I drove by and the lots were off. <laughs> you be, should have seen some flashlights. Would, that would have been hilarious if that's why I didn't make it. Because I was like, damn it, they're closed early. <laughs> it's like, oh no, he just turned out the damn lots. And I, uh, okay, but that was a great turnout for that show. That was that's my favorite show by far. Uh, it was a great turnout. I sold uh, a few pieces there. Uh, and it, and what's weird is the pieces that I sold yeah. were the ones that I was like making for the show that I was thinking like this, this is never going to, there was a few pieces. I went into that show thinking like, nobody's going to buy any of this. Yeah. You know, like I'm doing this because I have to say right. this, this is my, right. I have to say this, I have to get this out there and hopefully somebody will connect with it and know that they're not alone. Yeah. That's always my goal whenever I'm making something. Yeah. And then there was these few pieces that I made that I was like, you know what? Maybe somebody might want this. Somebody yeah. might buy this. Yeah. And then there was also these pieces that I made that was like, nobody's going to fucking buy this because it's you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The three of them were uh, self-portraits. And those are the ones that sold. See, nothing. To- so, <laughs> so my last show was called Look Up, Look Down. 
and it was half one. It was separated into two rooms. Mm-hmm. One room was w- the one I called hashtag cloud porn, where it was nothing but. Oh, I know the cloud porn. Where I where my big thing is, we don't appreciate the beauty that's in the daily life. So it was all photos I took with my phone of clouds, mm-hmm. and that was my point. And then the other room was the somebody lost their smokes room, where it was all the abandoned cigarette packs. I, I sold more abandoned <laughs> cigarette packs than I did clouds. And I was like, what the, f- who wants to hang a picture of an abandoned cigarette pack up on their wall? And there were a lot of friends like, no, I really like this a lot. Like, that's what I want. I don't want the clouds. Cl- I mean, I, I gotta, I gotta be honest with you. I like the, somebody lost their smokes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, what's funny is I made little postcards because there were some people that were like, I can't make it. And there were some friends that were like, I can't afford to buy a print. Mm-hmm. But if you had something else, I was like, I'll just make little postcards. And if nothing else, I'll use them as postcards. Yeah. I sold more cloud postcards than I did cigarette pack post postcards. Mm. But yeah, the, the cigarette packs that, so anytime you say that, I'm like, nah, it makes sense. You never yeah. know. You never know what's going to speak to somebody. Yeah, you, you don't. And, Cigarette and, packs. And, and that's still. the funny thing. My my favorite thing about that show was, though, there was this, uh, and this is funny to me, like I always think, like before yeah. a show, like there's always like these people that pop up in my mind that I'm like, I hope this person comes. Yeah. And there was this girl that uh, I'd known a long time ago, and she – she wasn't like really, she's not really into social media. Okay. So like, I was pretty sure that she had not seen like any of me like promoting and like uh, all that of like my show. And, um, there's this, uh, there's just a jacket that shows up in my work a lot. It's, it's been in a couple of my shows. Okay. It's this kind of like, uh, burnt orange jacket. I think I remember. Yeah. Um, on the last show, it it was in two pieces: a self portrait of me on a toilet, and then also a uh, um, a landscape uh, orientation piece of a shopping cart with a I bunch of stuff that. put in it, yep. which was kind of about me and my dad. And okay. Like, uh, but anyway, uh, yeah. So she came to the show, and I saw her there, and I was immediately like, like just like really excited to see her. Yeah. And, uh, uh, she had been like looking around and stuff and like, and then it hit me like that she wasn't, you know, she hadn't been following me like all this time because like right. she's not on social media. And I was like, Oh my God, you don't know. Yeah. And like, I took her over and I like showed her like the, the pieces with like that jacket in it. Yeah. And she got emotional. Really? And the reason is because, uh, years before I ever like got the courage to like start doing my artwork yeah and like really going for it and i was just like basically just a drunk who served tables and was just like trying to keep his head by, above water like yeah. serving tables paying yeah. bills have enough money to get drunk every night that was my thing okay and she gave me that jacket uh for a birthday present wow one year yeah okay. like i had just told her she she was wearing it and i was like man that's a great jacket i love that jacket yeah and she uh, it was like my, around my birthday and she just like one night she gave it to me. I think I walked her out to her car in the garage, like after a shift or something. And she gave me the jacket and she said, well, happy birthday. Oh my God. But the jacket, like whenever I would wear it, like during that time that I would, I just like felt really terrible about myself. Yeah. Um, and I was, I was just like a drunk, like she, or whenever I would wear that jacket, like it, it made me feel a little powerful. Okay. And it made me feel a little polished up. Okay. Whenever I was yeah. actually the opposite of both of those things. Yeah. And so it meant a lot to me and that's why it shows up in my work a lot. But like to have her there and like her see it and like have that response. Like yeah. That's, that's what I'm talking about. Like that's what I'm, I'm going for whenever I make a show. Like I want, I want people to, I just want people to feel something. So do you think when you create some pieces, I'm sure the answer is going to be both, but do you think there's some things that you let in subconsciously (laughs) as opposed to, as opposed to like the jacket was purposeful. (laughs) The jacket was like, I'm putting this in here for a reason. Yeah, no. Uh, 
so also in that last show in Exposed, uh, the one that was at Honeybee where I turned the lights out, I yeah. covered, I had eight panels in there, like big panels yeah. that I had like made for that show. Yeah. But then also I covered the walls in uh, sketch drawings that I had made over the course of like six years. Okay. And most of those were automatics. And whenever I say automatic, I mean like it's it's something that you drew without any thought. Okay. And so it's kind of like a, it's a surrealist practice. So the surrealists believe that if you, they believed in giving great sway, I'm putting that in quotes, um, to the subconscious. Okay. And okay. so like by just drawing without thinking, you kind of reveal like what's in your mind. Mm -hmm. And so the walls were covered in all those. And I could go to each one of them and I could be like, I know why I drew this. I knew why I drew this, like, after the fact. Yeah. And, like, right now, the work that I'm making, because um, I'm I'm just in a different spot in my life, uh, the work that I'm making now is 100% just, like, abstract and expressionistic. And I hope to show that I'm, well, I'm definitely going to show some of it uh, next month at, Lauren Lazarus uh, yeah. Gallery on Jackson yeah. Avenue. Yeah. Um, she's going to let me put up a few pieces there. Uh, but, like, I'm going to show some of it there. But, like, it's it's cra it's like a visual journal. Yeah. Like, I, I look at these pieces that I'm making, and, yeah, I'm just in my studio, and I just start, like, going to it. And, like, whenever I'm done, I sit back and I look at it, and I'm like, yeah, this makes sense. Okay. <laughs> Which is... Yeah. Uh, it's it's, it's kind of weird that you can, like, make this stuff and, like, tell on yeah. yourself. But but also it's it's a little bit therapeutic, I guess. Is there anything in all those that's, like, a repeating motif? Maybe not in all of them, but you see it. You're like, oh, this is in uh, well, 12 well, of 30 of them. Well, lately, right now, uh, the big... Uh, thing that I've noticed is that, uh, well, three things. Uh, one, there's a lot of contrast. Okay. Uh, two, I've I've been like taking the wood panels that I work on and I've been like carving into them. Okay. So it's it's work that not only do I want people to look at, but I literally want you to touch it. I'm going to show you this because I'm reading this article on this friend of mine. She goes by Deer Jerk on Instagram. Mm -hmm. She has like 80,000 followers, but she does, God, is there only one picture of her work? It's all these like wood carvings. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Like that's what well, she does. Well, are those block, are those prints? Mm -mm. No. No, okay. she does the wood carvings and she usually does not do prints. I'll uh, pull up. In fact, she just released a set of wood prints today, but she's. 65,000, 66,000 followers. She does a lot of like flying squirrels, stuff like that. Oh, okay. Like highly detailed woodblock prints. Uh, <coughs> and yeah, I, we, I was talking to her. I was like, oh, are you not doing, do you not do like prints out of those? She's like, not normally. I just like doing the wood woodblock. I think it's kind of the same thing of people being able, yeah. it's tactile. that you mentioned that and I've got an article pulled up, pulled up about her. Yeah, I Somebody, saw that when I came in. Yeah. But uh, yeah, that's the thing is like, you know, people, I think most people, you know, like you go and I'm I'm just like uh, going back to the, the December thing and that show of it like being, I want to create a space for my work. Okay. Like I want, I want you to come in. I don't want, I don't want like the work just to be on the sterile white walls and you shuffle past it. Right. Um, I want people to interact with it. And so like the December thing was really great because it, it, that happened. Like people were able to interact with it by like going around with like the flashlights and stuff. Right. Um, so in a sense I was like creating like a little bit of like that, right. that playhouse feel. And right. I, I fucking loved it. Yeah. Like <laughs> yeah. I, I, and I, I wanted it again. And yeah. so, like, I'm I've been like making all this work in my studio um, since then, like uh, starting in January. You know, I took a couple of weeks off, I guess, but like, 
and I'm trying to figure out where I'm going to put it or like how I'm going to show it and present it. Yeah. And I'm not sure yet. Like, I, I mean, I could, you know, I could go pay the Emporium to like, let me, let me show it in there. I don't want to do that. Yeah. Like, I don't, I don't want it on those well lit walls. Like I, 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 I don't know where it goes right now. And it's the show is still kind of telling me what it wants to be. Talk to UT. Because so, you know they have that studio right next to the Emporium, and they do that a lot where they'll show. Oh, shut. Downtown Gallery? Yeah. Yeah, I think you have to not, be an alum. Not 1010. To be in but there. Do you really? Yeah. Because that's where they did, like, did you go to the Violins of Hope? Thing? Yeah. Yeah. God. That's that was... that's my favorite spot. Like, uh, yeah. or my favorite stop on the Hunter Block is definitely the Downtown yeah. Gallery. And they'll be doing something for Big Ears. I'm trying to remember what they did for Big Ears last year, but I just remember walking in I mean, like, I can't see shit. I was like, yeah. and it was nighttime. I was just like, and I almost run stepped on somebody because you couldn't see anything in there until you got to a certain point where the projected screen was. But see, I'm like, I'm even looking for like other opportunities as far as like, um, there's there's something that I have in mind for the future that I would not mind showing underneath a bridge. Okay, you know, like I I'm just like I'm trying to think completely outside the box, like uh. I'll tell you another one to get in touch with. So do you know where Jax is next to Turn Club? Yeah. Okay. So I know the two guys that used to own that spot, mm-hmm. the Benz, uh, Village Marketing Group. It hey, was didn't in it there. used to be, isn't that space that used to be Knox Mason? Mm-mm, that's two doors down. Oh, okay. Uh, that's where Anaba is. Oh. Uh, but in Jax, if you go all the way to the back, there is a false floor that pulls up and it stairs down to the under underground. So really? you do you know about the under the hunt? Yeah. Yeah. So you can get down there from there. They did a, uh, the hell is that? You, <laughs> okay. You know, that dinner series, <laughs> you know, the dinner series no. where it was, uh, uh, where it would just pop up. They'd send you an email and the first 20 people who signed up got to go. Uh-huh. And they would do it in weird spots. Well, they did one down there. Like it, it, it sounds like tes- Texas Chainsaw Massacre, but you got to trust me. Like it's not. It's, like, it sounds beautiful to yeah. me. Yeah, <laughs> that's what I mean. Is once they get all that construction done with the two ramps, mm-hmm. the one going towards Sweet Peas yeah. and one going to the old city, they had access points from there to where you could get to it. So there may be opportunities there. It's a shame that the Emporium has that back area to where they have a door that goes to the underground. Why they don't do stuff back there, I have no idea. Mm. I think it's they just don't want to open it up and they're terrified people are going to get locked in there or whatever. Maybe. Who the fuck knows? I don't know. For years, (laughs) the city was trying to figure out a way to revitalize that down, that underground area, and they Mm. never figured it out. And it always blew my mind. I was like, you're just leaving money on the table because you could do all sorts yeah, of cool stuff. I thought down they there. could be like a whole, a uh, whole, like, you know, it's like, oh, we're going to the old city. We're going to the strip. We're going to market square. We're going to down or underneath. underground. Yeah. Under, yeah. yeah. That could be like a whole new like area. You could have shops. You could have office. You could do whatever the hell you wanted down there. Honestly, I feel like it would be just be better for like nightlife stuff. Oh, yeah. I think of like, cause I work out of my house and I'm yeah. like, Oh my God, that'd be perfect to be able to go down there and just kind of, because the same guy as the village marketing group, if you go into where Dewhurst properties is mm-hmm. there on the hundred block, there's stairs going downstairs. And that's where Jenny Andrews photography, Kate more creative where you can hook around and there's a set of offices down there that are on that level. Yeah. And it's awesome. They've got a little back area to where you can walk out and be on a little courtyard thing back there. It's amazing. Like, uh, so that's what I think about is the, the seclusion, but you're still in downtown. Like there's not the distraction of yeah. you're sitting there by a big window. <clears throat> you're, you're sitting in, I don't know. It's an immersion thing for me. I think it, you're right. It could also make maybe not for nightlife, but restaurants. I think you can make some kind of interesting restaurants down mm-hmm. there. Yeah, for sure. I think that's that might be like uh that might be like one of my my biggest things about like uh um artwork is like uh I mean, it's it's okay to like want something that's pretty 
right or or something that's beautiful in your home and you know like maybe it's your goal to just like have something on your wall that matches you know your interior your a rug or something like that but like i'm not i'm not interested in like making anything right. like that like i like i want i want something i want someone to take one of my pieces home and i want it to be like a centerpiece of their home because like it it speaks to them something that they can like sit in front of right something that um teaches them something right. or you know just like takes them somewhere you know just right. like just like a song you know like i was talking earlier about yeah. like how a song will take you somewhere like i i want my artwork to do that i feel like art galleries should have more chairs okay like, <laughs> like if they're if you put the work up and there was a chair in front of each piece like yeah. i i want people to like sit and look at it and take it in and That's not one just thing that, feel that yeah. urge to just like shuffle past. Yeah. That's a weird thing about like, uh, so when I went and saw Christina's World in public, er, it's in it was in MoMA at that time in mm-hmm. New York. I had no idea it was there. I was walking around. I'd been walking around in there for hours. Like my knees were killing me. Because I'd also walked all over New York. And yeah. my knees were killing me. It was probably an hour or so before closing time, and I walked into this room, and it was in there. And it was in there almost alone. Like, it occupied an entire wall in a smaller room, and then there were pieces on the other three walls. But I saw it, and I couldn't breathe, and I walked up to it, and I stood maybe 10 feet in front of it, and I literally told people to leave the room. I turned around. I was like, I'm going to need you all to get the fuck out of my way. <laughs> and they were like, what? And I was like, no, I, I, I need... A minute and I I you can't be walking in front of me like they were walking in front of me to see it and I was like no 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 like I forcibly ejected people from no, so rather than get kicked out because that that piece means so much to I me I 100% and, can appreciate that yeah and it was like but the funniest <clears throat> part and I have this argument all literally an hour or two before I've, I'm sure I've told this story before but I'm, I'm guessing you have not heard it I turned a corner, and as I was looking at a piece, I saw the secure woman security person bend over, like forward, mm-hmm. bend over forward, and I kind of looked at her. She was laughing, and she was fifty year old black woman walked up to me and she put her hand on my shoulder and she was like, "Honey, I have worked here for a long time. That's the funniest look I've ever seen on my face, on anybody's face as they've walked through here." And, and and she was like, and she looked at the piece. She was like, I don't know why you reacted to it that way, but it was hilarious. I was like, ma'am, I've been doing art since I was in the seventh grade. I don't know what the hell that is. That's not <laughs> art. And she was dying laughing. It's like, she was like, just whatever look I had, the look of disgust I had on my face just, pit, just made her tickled, like tickled her pink. Like, <laughs> and then an hour later, I'm forcing people out of a room. Like, you need to leave. Like, I need a minute. I need a minute. Well, that's like, that piece right there from my friend Saul of Reasonable Ron's Tires. Mm-hmm. I can't tell you why that means something to me, but he had a gallery of his work up, and I saw that piece. I was like, you know, he he's a he's a shooter for the Sentinel, so a lot of his work is editorial work. That was an editorial piece on, I think, uh, when we had a real bad black ice problem for like it was like a two week problem around town a few years back. So people were having to go get tires yeah. and it, it was an article, whatever it was about. But, uh, out of all the pieces there and some of them were, you know, UT sports, which I've grown up loving UT sports, but that piece spoke to me. I was like, Hey man, can I get a print of that? Can you send me like a high res? So he sent a high res copy and I made a print to size exactly how I want it. And it's been hanging up there ever since. I was like, I can't explain that. A lot of people look at that and go, what the fuck do you have a, Used tire shop <laughs> photo. I was like, I don't know. It just means something to me. There's a weird balance to that photo of the the one guy working and the two guys leer, old guys leering at him. I don't know. But yeah, art is art is strange. Art is weird. There's some friends of mine that when it comes to the friend who came up with the couch paintings, the phrase she hates those paintings. She hates them with every fiber of her being. Whereas I look at them and I kind of respect them on a technical level. 
I was like, man, when some of those people were doing that four or five, six hundred years ago, do you know, like, that's an incredible feat to get that done, especially if they're painting in oils. Like, to be able to sit and watch a look at a landscape and paint that over the course of weeks is, for me, it's a technical achievement in my mind. Yeah. But that's me. And I look at other people and I'm like, shut up, please. That's not art. That's not. I always joke. I was like, if you need four paragraphs to explain what it means, I struggle with it sometimes. Yeah. If I can't get it or if I can't, if it doesn't speak to me right off the wall, if it's painting around the edges of a blank canvas or if it's the slash where it's just a canvas slashed, it's like, I'm out. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know a nice way to put it, but it's, and that, that friend argues, she's like, yeah, but you're feeling something about that. It's like, yeah, but rage shouldn't be one of those things <laughs> that they, <laughs> they're trying to encourage in that. But So you want people, I'm trying to think how to put this. Like if they buy a piece, you want it to be, because there's a deeper connection there. And it's just like, yeah. oh, I just like the colors he chose. Yeah, no, uh, one of, um, one of my favorite artists is, uh, Bo Bartlett. I reckon he's that's a, the name. I'll have to look him <clears> up. <throat> he's a, uh, he, he does realism. Okay. Um, you know, like, uh, some of his pieces I like, I really like, and then there's some pieces that I don't really care for. I mean, but one of the, or I guess, one of the things I like about him is just a statement that he made. Uh, and that was that, uh, that it, that it needs to come alive. Right. And, and he said that, uh, you know, like whenever you're, you're making something mm -hmm. and, and this goes back to like what I was saying before about like how, you know, I'll like listen to certain music or there's, there's been projects that I've done that I'll, um, I try to go back to that place. Like I want to be in that moment whenever I'm right. making that piece, because I feel like that makes me give the best communication of like whatever I was feeling okay. Or, okay. or whatever the subject is. Yeah. So there's been like uh projects that I've been doing where like I'll, I'll go to certain places or I'll, I'll walk uh, right. certain streets. Right. And I'm just like trying to like glean like this energy or like uh, these memories from that to like be able to communicate that right. visually. And so, uh, yeah, like I, I, but Bo Bartlett says, you know, like, um, uh, he says, you know, like whenever someone's making something and that energy is inside of them and then it comes through their arm and yeah. onto the paintbrush or, or, or a pencil, whatever. And then it goes onto the canvas or the paper or the wood panel. In my case, like whenever that goes into it, like people can feel it. Right. So like, have you ever, you know, like you've been in an art gallery and you see a piece and like you were just saying about that one over there is like you, you see it and you're like, you don't know why. No. You're, yeah. Oh yeah. That happens. You all don't the know time. why, but like I, I feel, and I know this sounds kind of mystical, but, yeah. <laughs> but like, I, I feel like that energy, like for me, like whenever I'm making something and it goes through my arm and onto the panel no, that makes and then, sense. and then someone sees it and they have no explanation of like why I made it. Yeah. Like I, I feel like th that some people will see it and they'll stop and, and it'll just like catch them. Yeah. And it's because of that. I feel like, well, that's, I think that's why I buck against a lot of like art criticism, art, you know, whatever the, Rothko is lost on me. Oh my God. See, I look at Rothko. I was, I was, I was about, I was just thinking Rothko whenever you, before you said it. But Rothko's lost on me. But here's another way to look at it it's not for me. Yeah. It doesn't speak to me. That's okay. Yeah. But yeah, I have fun. friends that have fussed at me and yelled at me. I had one the other night say, No, you're wrong about that. I was like, No, I'm not. Cause it's not, it doesn't mean mm -hmm. anything to me. That's great that it means something to you. It doesn't, it doesn't. Because I get into that with like Norman Rockwell and MC Escher. I've got yeah. friends that are like, well, no, they're on like coffee mugs, so they don't but count. Dude, I'm like, like, yeah, they do. <laughs> it's, 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 it's the same thing with music. Oh, yeah. I mean, like, there's, there's plenty of music that you're going to listen to, and you're like, 
damn, I feel this. Like I'm yeah. connecting to this. Yeah. And it's because of what's behind the music. Yeah. The same thing with art. Like you're going to look at certain art and you're going to be like, I'm connecting to this yeah. and some you're not, you know, like, uh, yeah, no, it is, it's exactly the same thing. Like I, I love Rothko. Yeah. Which, you know, uh, whenever I first gained appreciation for him, yeah. I was not doing anything like that. Yeah. Like I was 100% just like realism, yeah. which is complete opposite of Rothko. Right. But there was something about it. And I was just like, I love this. Right. But it was like on further investigation of like uh, learning about him and like why he made the stuff that he made. Like now I, I can kind of see why I was invested in well, it. Well, that's like my one of my favorite, one of my top threes is Piet Modrian. And I'm sure a lot of people look at him and are like, why in the hell do you like, do you know Piet Modrian? No, I'm not. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to pull it up because <laughs> it's kind of the same thing with Pollock. Like, I didn't real appreciate Pollock until I read Norman Rockwell talking about Pollock. Because uh-huh. Norman Rockwell did a cover to a Saturday Evening Post where it was, there was an article on modern art inside. Yeah. And it was around the time where Pollock was. And he said, uh, "See, that's that's one that I don't I don't really connect with he, to this point in my life." He said that that piece on the cover of Saturday Evening Post was not a Pollock. He actually tried to recreate a Pollock, and he said it's the hardest thing I've ever done in my life. I read that sentence. I was like, "Okay, I understand Pollock now." Mm-hmm. Like that's all it took. So this is Piet Mondrian. Blocks and oh yes okay yes I've seen this so I've got friends that they're this I'm not is, I'm not I'm not I'm ashamed to say like I I'm not very good with like uh I I have the artists that I I that I like right. and that I look up to but I'm not I'm not super well versed on art I history I have been immersed in art since. On the flip side, I'm the only art in, artist in my entire family. In yeah. my entire family, as far as it stretched out, as far as everything goes backwards, even down to like third and fourth cousins, I'm the mm-hmm. only artist in my family, which is super weird. Like it's, I've done stuff to where my parents are like, I don't understand what you're doing, but we're just going to assume you know what the hell you're doing. It's like, okay, thanks, guys. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, but Piet Mondrian, I got. Because when I was in high school, this was the favorite artist of my teacher who had all four years in high school. Like in middle school, it was his favorite artists were Giorgio O'Keefe and Salvador Dali. So I got to really mm-hmm. learn about them. Piet Modrian, had I not had Miss Waller at Fulton, I probably would have never known who the hell he was. Like, and I've got to see some of his pieces up close and personal, and it's kind of awe inspiring. Like, it's. There are people who try to recreate that, and they're like, it's it's almost impossible to get it exactly how he did it, which is weird because I've built one of those pieces. I've built it out of construction paper for, for a, a piece I did on the apocalypse. It was what should be saved in the apocalypse, and I said art museums. So I made a Rothko, mm. and I made a Piet Mondrian to be up on the walls mm. in that piece. Uh, <clears throat> No, no, no. They, dude, uh, I've got friends who are so nerdy and versed in photography that I mention names I know, like Minor White. That I'm like, I'm cool because I know who Minor White is. And they're like, no, you're not. No, you're not. Minor White's pretty big. I was like, Minor White is not big. Most people don't know who the <laughs> fuck that is. You I think dumbass. I know who you're talking about, but I'm not completely <laughs> but, sure. But my friends are like, no, no, no. I like this, this, and this. I was like, oh, God, never mind. Jesus. Okay. You're just versed in this. I was like, <laughs> uh, so no, it should never. Same thing with music. Like, uh, who was it? There was somebody I was talking, talking about a band to a friend of mine. And I was like, well, you know this band. He's like, no, I have no idea. And he's all, uh, you know, a year or two older than me. I was like, how the fuck do you not know that band? And he was like, never really listened to them. I was like, God, okay, here's what you need to be listening. You know, I start pulling it up on my phone. I was like, how the hell do you not know who this is? Like, it's wild to me. Uh, So, no, I think everybody has holes and gaps. You can't be, no one is ever complete when it comes to whatever they choose to be. Yeah, I mean, like, I I understand that I'm I'm not for everybody. No? You know, like, uh, you know, the same way I, I look at a lot of people's work and I'm like, Okay, I can respect this, but like this yeah. is, this isn't for me. 
you know, um, it's, it's just going back to what I was saying. Like, I, I feel like artwork, uh, is just, it's more on a spiritual level. Like it's, right. it's, it's something that is going to speak to your soul. Yeah. And if it, if it doesn't, then you have no business buying it or like, I mean, you can buy it if you want, I guess, but like, you know, I, I would, I would only invest in the pieces that, you know, like they, they say something to you right. or they, they take you somewhere. I think that's like that. what drives me nuts about art criticism is there's a lot of people who are famous artists that the only reason people buy their pieces because they know they're going to be worth money later. Yeah. It's like, that kind of drives me nuts. I was like, well, that person wouldn't be famous if they didn't get X article written about them. And, <clears throat> you know, yeah. I mean, uh, if you look at the art market as a whole, you know, there's a very small percentage of artists that make, you could, you could say like, uh, X amount of money is made in the art market every year. Yeah. You know, but like there's a tiny, tiny percentage oh, yeah. of artists. And, and that's like Basquiat, yeah. Pollock, uh, yeah. Rothko, you know, stuff like that. It's things are being like uh, Banksy, things are like being sold and resold or whatever. And those are the things that are making most of the money. And in then, the and then yeah. beyond that, you have people like me. They're yeah. just like, just trying to, you know, yeah. make a way or, or make a, a true expression and, and share it with people. So one of the earlier episodes I did it on, I did it with a guy who he's the one who did the mural on the market square parking garage, that big one with the mm. blocks. Yeah. The, his story was kind of interesting. Like that's kind of what he does. He was like, I, he's like, I figured out a way to be a mural artist. I figured out ways to apply for, and I get, he was like, I give them my idea. He was like, I don't ask them what do they want me to paint to represent the city. I pitch them an idea and they accept it. So that's someone, whenever I end up going back up to schools and teaching kids about, make, I always say making money in art. Mm-hmm. It's like, you don't have to work at Denzo. You don't have to work at Stock and Barrel. No offense to them. Yeah. Like if you want to make money in art, there's all these different avenues to do it. And they're like, I was like, I always tell them, I was like, it may be hard. You may have a lot of rough years. You may have to still work at Stock and Barrel and do this. But you need to do it because you need to get it out of you and you need to at least try. Because if you don't try, you don't want to yeah. regret it at 80 to be like, well, I wish I would have given, you know, doing these paintings as a go. Mm-hmm. You got to get it out of you. Well, you know, uh, I only work a little bit at Stock and Barrel these days and uh, i wasn't pointing at that i was just using that <clears throat> yeah as a prime example of like there's a lot of people i was like no get a damn job no no i well what i was gonna say was that like i i really value the time that i spent at stock and barrel working full time like because yeah. you know after i left Rome county and i came here and i kind of just like fell into this thing of like just like being drunk all the time like right. you know it was like go it's to a work cycle. it's a cycle yeah it's just go to work get off work People want to have drinks, go to get drinks, uh, sleep on someone's couch, whatever, blah, blah, blah. Repeat the same thing every day. But, like, I took a few classes in community college on art, and that's it. Okay. I I spent six years in college, and I I did everything but art. Okay. Because, like, coming from the small town, you know, it was like, you can't do that, man. Yeah. Like, you got to do something that's going to make money. So I kept, like, trying to, like, conform my life into something that – you know, would, would do that. But if I had to do it all over again, I would just do art from the beginning and say, fuck it. Yeah, but like all that's getting choked away to where it's a 15 year old kid in high school. And you're like, what do you want to do with your life? Yeah. It's like, well, fuck, I'm 15. <laughs> I'm <laughs> well, that's, a kid, that, that's a whole nother kid, subject. Yeah. Yeah. But, but I look at, I look at those like, uh, four, four and a half years that I spent at stock and barrel working full time. And, just being drunk all the time. Yeah. And I did a lot of stupid stuff. Like yeah. I've, I've, I slept in latitude 35 one night and set off the alarm and yeah. ran across the square barefoot. Uh, I got kicked out of several, I got kicked out of Sutri's once, like yeah. not, not just kicked out. I mean like banned. I got banned from the pub. Who gets banned from the pub? Oh my God. <laughs> That's pretty <laughs> I, crazy. <laughs> I've slept on a firehouse lawn and on a bed of Taco Bell wrappers, I've 
This all sounds like a country song to me. <laughs> <laughs> I, I I did a lot of stupid shit. Yeah. And uh, but like I feel like that was my school. Yeah. Like I I it's just that's the type of person I am. Like I take the experiences that I've had and I I try to translate them. Yeah. In into something for other people to consume. And um, I feel like the Taco Bell wrappers needs to be on a future painting. <laughs> I think that would be amazing. It was like, right next to Beard and Beer Market, that, like, that fire hall that's yeah. that's next to that. Let I slept fi- under a little tree. Let a fire be coming from the Taco Bell wrappers, man. Yeah. No, I've, I've slept on a sidewalk before. Um, God, just like, but like all that stuff, you know, as bad as it was and like as bad of a place that I was in, you know, like I'm, I'm able to now take that in and try to translate it visually, and yeah. that's what the March show was mostly about. Yeah. Um, I called it the American Realist. It was, uh, it was me trying to like reflect on those times, and and, and kind of because sh- you said it was more of a broader, so it was kind of showing you were in a better place. Yeah, because yeah, everything was very clear because it was yeah. it was all realism. Yeah. So it was like me being able to look at back on that like clearly, and it was a lot of closure for me. Yeah, like I remember the day that I was like sealing all the work because, like, like I said, I work mostly in, I do mixed media, but a lot of it ends up being like pastel. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's probably the majority of my work. So like it's dry media, so you have to seal it. So when people take it home, you know, you can't yeah. smear it or yeah. or whatever. Uh, but like I was sealing the work for that show, and I was just like looking around, and I was like, man, this is like the the best way for me to like bury this, this part of my life. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, no, I got a little emotional. It was, it was, it was, it was a great experience for me. And and that's, and that goes back to like, uh, yeah, you know, like the, the art shows that I do, they're, like I said, they're, they're like kind of like an investigation yeah. into myself. And, and sometimes, sometimes they yield closure. Other okay. times they don't like the delusionary thing. It didn't yield closure for me. I think it gave me a better understanding of yeah. like how uh, I can be unreasonable in romantic situations. The exposed thing about mental health, mm-hmm. it didn't bring closure. There's no, there's no cure to depression. Yeah. Um, like, but it, but it gave me a better understanding of like where I'm at. And I, I, you can laugh at this if you want. I give the same damn speech to everybody I know that's going through rough times. And it's, here's where you're going to laugh. It's a quote from Rocky Balboa. (laughs) There's a Rocky Balboa came out like 2009, I think. And he has a speech to his son talking about keep moving forward. And I, I give that speech to somebody new at least once every three weeks. Like one gal I know, she posted something on Instagram. I was like, I just sent her a DM. I was like, somebody I don't know that well. I was like, are you okay? And she was like, uh, I'm getting there. She was like, my fiance and I broke, my fiance and I broke it off in December. Mm-hmm. And it's just been really rough. So I was like, okay. And just, and I wrote down like a paragraph. I was like, you got to keep getting, getting up every morning. You got to keep moving forward. It's like, no matter what. <laughs> it, and you can laugh, but it's like, it's true. You got to just, no matter what, you gotta realize there will be betterness <coughs> on down the line. You just have to keep moving forward. A friend of mine is now been sober for ten months and she can't get a job. And she was like, This is times where I would start drinking more. And mm-hmm. she was like, The only reason I'm not is because I remember how bad that made me feel and I don't want to feel that ever. I was like, You're gonna get through this. There are brighter times ahead of you. You have to, you have people around you that care. You just have to realize there are people around you that care, and let those people in and keep moving forward. Keep moving forward is how I end every one of them. I'm like, you just got to keep moving forward, man. You got to. Do you are you you're laughing? Are you agreeing or disagreeing? Oh it's, no, no, I, I feel you. Uh, it's not a cheerleader thing. It's just it's what clicked in me because there was a year that was maybe, and this has just like been within the last two years the roughest year of my life like everything went wrong everything top to bottom personal professional everything Mm -hmm. and through it all like the honest answer that i have never said on here before is i got like six months behind on my house where they're going to foreclose on the house oh really yeah and i just work wasn't coming i was working my ass off just nothing was coming right 
And uh, <laughs> it's funny coming from somebody who's had a gun in his face a bunch of different times that this was my roughest year. And through it all, there were times where I was like, okay, should I give up? Should just this be it? I was like, no, no, something is going to happen. And I just got to, I don't want to say faith, but it's just like, mm -hmm. no, I, I can get through this. You just, I got to keep moving forward. And I sit here now and I'm still in a little wonky world, but I'm like, no, giving up is not an option. I have to keep yeah. moving forward. <laughs> no, I feel, I feel that, man. Yeah. So in going through all these uh, exhibits and shows, do you have in the back of your mind or in your book over there like <laughs> a list of shows or ideas for shows for the oh, future? Uh, yeah, no, there's there's always a, a plethora of, of ideas. Yeah. It's uh, from the minute I, I, I finish one, uh, I feel like there's automatically just like I have a hard time like turning my brain off. Right. And this is funny. Like I, I've never liked going to the movies, mm -hmm. you know, like I was like, man, this is stupid. Like I can That's do this why at you home. Laughed at Rocky Balboa. <laughs> 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 yeah. I was like, I never liked going to the movies, yeah. but then, uh, I learned last year, um, that I, I really like it. I mean, like yeah. I, I can go with someone if I want, but like, uh, I also just like really enjoy going to the movies by myself Yeah, because like, it's one of the only times that I can turn my brain off Yeah, because like, you know, the lights go down or go down and I, you know, you have to turn your phone off or you're an asshole Yeah, and I'm just like, I just get immersed in the movie Yeah, and I always like to sit up front. Like I know a lot of people don't like to do that, but I sit up front and yeah, I have like my head back, but like I'm right there in front of the screen and I can't see any distractions and I get immersed in it. I'm the the last movie that I saw was alone was the Joker. And I, I fucking loved it. Like I, I left the theater and I felt different. Yeah. And it was actually like, and it was great timing too. Cause it was whenever I was making the work for exposed about okay. mental health. Yeah. So like, uh, yeah, but, uh, yeah, no, I, I always have like ideas coming to me. Like it, it just doesn't stop. I keep, this book in my back pocket, like at all times, mm -hmm. um, I always have something on me that I can like record stuff. Yeah. And if, if something happens and I don't have that, then I, I text it myself. Yeah. Like that's, that's, Oh yeah. Yeah. There's, there's no way that I'm not going to be able to like record, uh, the thoughts that are coming out of my head. Cause there's so many of them. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned men mental health a few times. Like, do you think some of the art is helping you get through issues or is it trying to address issues in others? Or I'm sure a little bit of both. Uh, I mean, if I'm being honest, like the, the art that I make about mental health is it's me trying to get through it. Okay. Like, uh, and I mean, uh, I don't mean that sound like selfish, but like, I, no. I feel like I, I'm not one of a kind. Yeah. As as far as like mental health goes, I mean, there's plenty of other people out there that are dealing with exactly what I'm dealing with. Right. And, um, so then, you know, just like going back to what I said before, like, you know, the, the artwork that I make, like I, w I want people to connect to it. So I imagine, you know, someone, maybe someone seeing something that I've made yeah, and, you know, just like. I'm in my studio and like, I'm, I'm feeling about this and, and I, I put it on a wood panel and then I hang it up and people come by and they look at it and there's someone that sees it and they, they feel it because they're in that same place too. You know, it, it's, it's the reason why people, uh, write books, write poems, make movies, write songs. It's the right. same reason why I went and saw the Joker by myself and sat in the theater in the dark and, I, I had an emotional experience with it. Right. It's because, you know, someone made that, but like I, I'm connecting to it. Right. So right. that's, that's what I'm hoping will happen whenever I make my work. Okay. Do you want to say, what is the next one you have up on the docket? 
<laughs> or do you do you not want to? Uh, well, yeah. no. I mean, like I said before, I think the the next thing that I have is next month. It's going to be at Lauren oh, okay. Lazarus's yeah. uh, gallery. It's not a solo show. Me and her uh, showing together, I guess. Um, so like, uh, I'm just going to show a few pieces, but it, it's it'll be the stuff that I've been making lately. That okay. like I was saying before is like kind of like a visual journal. Okay. And um, but uh, the as far as like my next solo show. Yeah. Uh, like I said, I don't, I don't know. I don't know where it's going to be. Cause you um, want it to be more immersive. Yeah. I'm looking for a unique venue to, to show it someplace that's going to like, let me totally change it into what I want it to be. Like I want to create an environment for the work. You might reach out to Jason at the pilot lot. You know, I, I did think about them. <laughs> it's hard getting him to respond. I also thought about Dale at, uh, at uh, Central Central Collective. She won't let you touch the walls, man. Yeah. Because when I hung my artwork up there, it was like, no. No. It's not as... Uh, you can do stuff in the middle, but uh -huh. you couldn't do anything with the walls. Yeah, no. I mean, well, I don't know that I would need to okay. manipulate the walls, but uh, as long as, like, as a whole, it'll, like, let me take the space and, and do something like oh, yeah. turn lights out or, you know, just, like, let me make an environment, then then that's that's for me. Yeah, because they did that with Josh Shorey's show uh, to where he does this work with, like, metalwork and sand to where he set up this thing that slowly dissipated sand mm -hmm. throughout the entire night. So and it was taking up the entire middle of the so room. There was like sand on the floor. Yep. Oh, that's cool. And how it expands. Yeah. So, so yeah, that's that's something I'm talking about. I would say if, with her, hit her up sooner rather than later because they get booked. Hell, I don't yeah. know how far out they're booked. Right no, now. I, I already talked to her on Instagram. Yeah. I think maybe like a month ago or something. Oh, okay. Good. And Good. I, I told her the same thing. I just said here is like I don't know what it's going to be because like I'm still trying to figure it out, but. Uh, uh, but yeah, Pilot Light, they don't do much for First Friday. That uh, skateboard actually come from a pilot. The only First Friday I've ever seen at Pilot Light where they <laughs> got a bunch of different artists to paint on skateboards Yeah, and hang those up all around. If you go in there now, there's still some hanging up. So that night, there was probably 50 to 60 pieces hanging up. That one... On, in what we've talked about before, almost felt like it leapt off of the damn wall. Mm -hmm. and I was like, I need to have that one. That one's not sold, is it? And I kept pointing at it, and they're like, no, it wouldn't be here if it was sold. I was like, okay, I want to buy that one. I, like, yeah. Almost like I'm not leaving here without that damn piece. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, bought it. Cause I was like, I don't know what it is. I don't even know who the hell the artist is. Because they didn't have, because it's pot like, God love Jason. Yeah. And they didn't have anything up. There's, <laughs> It's not signed or anything. No. I should post it up on Instagram or Facebook and go, does anybody know who the hell painted this? Because I would love to know who painted it. Hmm. Uh, no, I just piecemeal. Like, the piece below the reasonable bronze is my friend Caitlin that she does photography and she does all this cool stuff with, like, shadows and light. And I went to her show at uh, Trailhead. And they... And there was something about that one. I liked how it was split. It wasn't a double exposure. It's actually two photos, almost like in between two different negatives on a roll. I was mm -hmm. like, I really like that. Uh, yeah, I'll keep thinking. Like, Pilot Light, I think, is your best bet. Because they're so weird about, like, yeah, just do whatever the hell you want. Yeah. You just got to bring it in on your own. Dogwood Arts also might be another good one. Because they do monthly galleries, and they let people take over. The One of the last shows I went there the artist created woodcuts of people that you actually had to walk through mm -hmm. to get in there. So they might be another good avenue. But I think see, the pop-up see like, I think the I'm, pop up pop up idea is not a bad idea. It's just Yeah, like I'm 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 not opposed to like uh doing something totally unconventional like uh somebody's fucking basement. Yeah. You know, like uh I'll, I mean, oh, shit. I'll promote it. Birdhouse would be as much. another good one. Birdhouse, yeah. See, that's that's a good idea. I didn't even thought about that. But I'm like, just trying, all I'm thinking is is something covered. So if it rains, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just trying to get your back there. Like, the underpass. The underpass. <laughs> yeah. Oh god. I have I have thought about that underpass, uh, the James White Parkway underpass, yeah. an island home. 
I've thought about that one a lot. Yeah. Really. Um, but uh, yeah, like I, like I said, I just don't know, man. Like uh, I just I just I just keep making the work, and and yeah. we'll see where it goes, and uh, I'll put it where it needs to be. Yeah. Okay. Uh, something we hadn't touched on yet. If you want to get into homelessness. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. So do you want to <clears throat> delve in there or do you, <laughs> uh, we can, um, I don't know how much you're going to, or you, how long is this podcast? It's however long it is. Okay. <laughs> Cause I feel like we've been talking for we've a while. We've been talking for an hour and 46 minutes. Oh shit. I've got one that lasted for six hours. Oh wow. Okay. And at the end of that, I could not speak. And I also got, love you, Shane, couldn't get him the hell out of my house. <laughs> we stood in my kitchen and talked for another hour. And I was like, dude, I can't talk. Yeah. I need you to leave. <laughs> uh, uh, well, I'll just, I'll just say this. I'll like make it really uh, concise. Uh, homelessness is, is something that's very uh, close to my heart. And that's because I think, I think I touched on this earlier is that my father right. was homeless and uh, I hadn't spoken to him in the last couple of years of his life. He died at the Salvation Army shelter. Um, but I, I'll just, this is all I'm going to say is that I, there's a large grant that I applied to just last week. Okay. And uh, I won't hear anything until the spring. Okay. Uh, so not long from now to know if like I've even become like a finalist or something for it. Yeah. But uh, I mean, there's, there's thousands of applicants because it's, it's a large grant Right. And it's a free application. So they got a lot of stuff to sort through. And but like they wanted something adventurous, something that's gonna like change the community. And my proposal was that um for one month I would leave everything and, and go live homeless. Okay. Here in Knoxville. Okay. okay. Homeless, especially here, is such a sticky wicket because it's so there's, it's so rampant, and I feel like it's yeah, getting it's, even, uh, it's getting even worse everywhere. I, I've I've left Knoxville and went to other cities, like larger cities. Yeah, and have I literally was at a stoplight with a, a friend in Atlanta, not last summer, but the summer before, and she said to me, she was like, "Have you noticed we haven't seen a lot of homeless people?" And we were in Atlanta. Yeah, <laughs> and I was yeah. like, "Oh my God, you're right." And, uh, I, we came back to Knoxville and I went and, uh, uh, walked, uh, the dog down at, uh, the world's fair park. Yeah. And it was like, as soon as I got back Yeah, and I, I walked out in, in to the park and it was just automatic. It was like one after another, just homeless people coming up to me and like asking me for money and stuff. See on the flip- And like, I'm, I'm not like, uh, like I, I see each one of them as like a human being. Like right. they're, they're, there's some, I know a lot of people, uh, it's, yeah, it's easy to get annoyed with them, you know, cause like they're asking you for money and stuff and, but there's a reason they're out there, Yeah, you know, there's, there's, there's something more. And plus it, it's someone, there's a good chance that someone loves them Yeah, and may not even know that they're out there. I, I talked to a, a homeless man last summer who asked me for some food and I went and got him some food and I sat and I talked with him for a while. His name was Joe. Uh, he was out on gay street, um, uh, right down from Cruz uh, farms, ice cream. And he told me, and one of the things he told me was like, I asked him, I was like, you know, uh, you're out here all the time. Do you have like a reoccurring thought that comes to you? Yeah. And he said, yeah, he was like, I just, I feel ashamed a lot. Uh, I feel embarrassed. Yeah, and and then he started telling me about his kids and how his kids, he would talk to them from time to time on the phone, but he he never told them that he was out there, huh? And so that that really like uh, touched me because like, you know, like I I didn't talk to my dad for the last yeah. two years, and who's to know that the last time that I talked to him it was on the phone. I don't know that he was in that situation then. Yeah, and he was just like acting like it wasn't happening or what or wasn't gonna divulge it to me, you know, yeah. to like worry me or something. Yeah. You know, cause people, people in that, a lot of people in that situation, like they've, they're going to feel a lot of shame and, you know, like, you know, it's your loved ones, the people you care about most about that, like you don't want 
them to see you that way. Right. So like, uh, yeah, I just like encouraged him. I was like, man, I was like, you know, just like talk to your kids. Like, cause yeah. you know, I, I, I mean like, I, I don't know the position you're in, but like, I, I know that, you know, my dad died out here and like, I would have given anything for him to tell me what was going on. And, like we could possibly help him in some way. Right. It's, I don't even know where to begin. On the flip side, I was in Atlanta and I stayed in a part town where I saw it, it walked by the house mm-hmm. all day. There's one day I just walked out to my car to get something and a guy started asking me about doing work on the house I was staying in. And I was staying at Airbnb. I was like, dude, not my house. Sorry. And then another guy came up and took all the wind out of it because he made a joke. He's like, what are you, like 6'1", 6'2"? I was like, you're way the hell off. What the hell are you talking about, brother? <laughs> <laughs> it's like, uh, but I look at, like, I've been out in San Francisco a lot, and the homeless <coughs> pro- pro- problem out in San Francisco is really fucking bad. It's really bad. Yeah. And it's, uh, I don't know. And I keep hearing about L.A., how it's getting even worse in L.A. Like, they have Skid Row, and they're like, it just keeps growing and growing and growing. There's like, there's got to be something to be done. They're like, it's just who owns that? Who wants to take that responsibility? How can we make it work? You know, going down to all the all the line of uh, how. Mm-hmm. The how to fix it. And do they want... Some of them I've heard it's like given opportunities and just don't want to. Yeah. Which is another biggest issue right now, which is second on this list, is mental health issues. How many yeah. people there are out there on the streets? Uh, yeah, lots of them. That it that everything could be solved if they got drug treatment or mental health treatment. Yeah, and then that goes back to how how is that treatment available to them? Yeah. Uh, which we could talk oh <laughs> until tomorrow morning about stuff like that. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I mean, like, it's it's just. Uh, and I think, and a lot of people I've talked to, some of the homeless people I've talked to, it's ex- exactly what you said about there's somebody in their life that loves them. There's a lot of people there out there that don't, that that thought has been out of their mind for 10 years. That they haven't, you know, they're just like, oh no, nobody loves me. Like, you know what yeah. I mean? It's just gone. That That little slice of their brain is gone. Well, when you're left alone, yeah, you know, and especially in like a state like that, yeah, uh, you know, like I haven't lived on the streets, but if if I got that grant and like I could do that project, which I'm probably going to do it either way, like yeah. even if I don't get that grant, yeah, and it's something that I thought about long before I ever saw that grant as like a way for me to connect with my father, yeah, and like try to figure out like where he was at like the last two years of his life. Uh, is like they, when you're left alone like that, your mind can convince you of incredible oh, yeah. things. Oh, I yeah. mean, like not even me, not even being homeless, like, uh, like, you know, in some of like my struggles with like mental health, like, and, and the point, one of the points behind the exposed show in December was that like, it can convince you that this is, you're the only one. Yeah. This is just you. Like you yeah. everybody else is different. Everybody else is good. They got it together. Um and so like that was my point in making that show. It was like an outstretched hand to anybody that came in right. that saw it that was in that similar position. See, I do that by saying, you know social media is bullshit, right? <laughs> I say that so <laughs> often where it's like, you know all that's the best photo. Like yeah. I just I love posting stuff that is not perfect just to be like no it's all bullshit it's all it's all fake it's all not real you can't let your own self get mired in struggle because you're seeing other success Mm -hmm. because they're still going through rough times and so i can't tell you how many people i know that if you looked at all their social stuff you'd think their world was perfect and then you're like and then six months later they're divorced they're fighting over the kids they're all that it's like yeah Mm -hmm. look at their social media from three months before Never saw that coming. Whereas if you actually sat and talked with them, you knew that shit was coming. Yeah. 
see, I, I make it a point like that. I, I want to be completely open yeah. and, and honest. Uh, ima- imagine, imagine trying to date and, uh, going out on a date with a girl and her asking you like what your work's about. I was like, well, right now I'm working on, uh, a show about how I'm crazy in relationships. <laughs> <laughs> So not everything needs I mean, a voice. That's my advice to you. Not everything needs a voice. Not everything. There's there's a bit of sacrifice to it, but like I I I 100 feel like it's my duty and my responsibility because like I've been given a gift to be able to communicate things visually. Yeah, and I I just like I have no other choice. This is like yeah. what I got to do. Yeah, I I have to do this. Yeah, I I there nothing else for me. And so, like, it's it's got to benefit someone, right? And you know, like, yeah, I got to sacrifice a little bit for that, I guess. I always but look. I, at, I'm just going to be like, I'm I'm going to lay it all out there. Yeah, I get that too. Cause, you know, I work for myself, so there's been times where it's not everybody gets this life, and mm. I, and I just have to say, this is the path I'm on. It's like you can either choose to come on this path with me, or you can say you don't get it but you still want to walk this path with me or you can move on i i'm not going to deviate from this because this is where i'm at so it's kind of the same thing although it's not i usually wait until at least the third or fourth date to let them know about all my dating craziness (laughs) (laughs) well actually there are two podcasts that are if you combine them together it's about five to six hours worth of podcasts where I tell nothing but scary dating stories. (laughs) So if they really want a deep dive, they can probably find my, my weird shit. As soon as someone like asked me what my Instagram is and like, I mean, cause I, I put it all out on the descriptions of like every piece that I post. So like, uh, I'm like, all right, well, you got the keys of the kingdom now. Yeah. You, you You're know. almost sitting in front of him like this. And I'm like, What's going to happen now? <laughs> uh, almost like looking over their shoulder like, oh, you got to that piece. Oh, wait, I can't wait. This shit's about to pop off. I'm going to see if, if you're in or not. If you're in, I might be a little scared. <laughs> all right. Thank you for doing this. Oh, yeah, man. This is great. Thank you. Uh, I always love talking about my work um, and opportunities that are coming up. So, like, uh, this is my first podcast. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. It's only no, I going up it. from here. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right.